every dig digital touch point is now becoming a transaction touch point, right? So now everything you do digitally, you're seeing something, there's probably gonna be some type of action that you wanna take or what I call and try to teach merchants is don't lose the moment of inspiration. You just talked about it. I might lose the moment of inspiration if you ask me to retype my card because all of a sudden my phone or my laptop doesn't recognize the protocols that you used and doesn't bring my eight cards up without using a wallet. You know, it's just there right now. Like, which one of these eight do you want to use that you use to buy at Uber and Lyft and Amazon and something else? It keeps it all in memory. If I don't have that experience, I'm going to lose that customer now. Timmy Nafso here with Embedded. In this episode, we have Mark Bishop, Senior Vice President and Head of Embedded Payments and Finance at Fortis, an industry veteran with over 30 years of experience in the payment sector, particularly in PayFAC, marketplaces, and other third-party models, along with a deep understanding of the dynamic realms of fintech and insurtech. Mark has a remarkable history of leadership and advisory positions, having made significant contributions to prominent organizations such as Bank of America Merchant Services, Amaryllis, and NTT Data. And uh, my friend, Mark Bishop, welcome on the Embedded Podcast. Thanks for joining today. Timmy, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. For sure. Yeah. So I know that you're, you're kicking off. I'm actually going to kick this off. I know you love to travel. Yep. Uh, you've done quite a bit of it, not only for fun, but also for, for, for work. You have actually uh, an exciting trip ahead of you here, uh, from what I understand as well. Correct. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and then a little bit about the travel that you've done uh, as it relates to work and then uh, uh, personal. I know people have bucket lists of where they want to go and uh, across the world. Uh, so a little bit about that would be great. No, it's awesome. In fact, it's my wife uses the term bucket list because I'm knocking a few off her list, right? So I'm always the one that travels nice. and I've done things. And she's one of seven kids, the only one born in the States. So her whole family's Dutch um, and they're very European and very well traveled. And then she meets me, the mutt American, as, as we say, because I've got a, a huge lineage of a number of different uh, backgrounds and I've traveled more than her around the world. And I was able to do that from my early days in Pricewaterhouse. But the trip we have coming up is a big one we booked in like 18 months ago to go to South Africa, Egypt, Hong Kong, and back you know, through various cities and others. Beautiful. And she's a jewelry artist. So we pick up stones around the world and then she hand makes them and does that for charities and other pieces. But I've been traveling, as you said, eh, probably 35 years now, ever since leaving college and starting with Pricewaterhouse. And they, pay, or I said, you're going to pay me to travel the world. I'm like, where do I sign? Right. And, you know, I was living more externally to the States than internally to the States from Hong Kong, Mexico city to Latin America, Argentina and El Salvador. Um, and then Brussels and Spain and other places. So I took it full advantage of it while I could, um, before starting a family and doing everything else. So I got all the travel out of the way. Um, uh, but I thought this trip, you know, she deserved a couple places uh, to be able to knock off her list. That is awesome. Where was your favorite place if you had to rank, like, must see, Timmy? You got to get there and see what's going on over. Uh, you know, depends what stage age. of life you're in. So, must see if you're right. single. Back before the Chinese handover, it would have been Hong Kong. That's the city of twenty four seven city that doesn't sleep. New York sleeps now, and Hong Kong, no. At that point, when you go. Um, or Ibiza, depending on your, your age group of where you're at. But as you get older, you get places like Rio. Um, the beaches of Ipanema and others are definite must-see at, at that point. Um, the waterfalls of Argentina, another thing that you don't get to see. And growing up in Buffalo, I had Niagara Falls, and I was impressed. Oh, yeah. Right? So uh, you yeah. know, there's good places like that going around or uh, Iceland, nice. you know, because it's the opposite, right? Where Iceland is green and Greenland's ice. Iceland is green. green. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard good things about that. And uh, it's funny. Um, I have traveled quite a bit throughout the United States. Of course, Mexico uh, made my way across overseas. I interviewed my grandmother um, and it was one of these things where I wanted to talk about what it took for her to come into the United States, you know, nine children and this family splitting up and so on and so forth. And during that interview process, I asked her that very question of, hey, where is a must see place? Sure. And she mentioned two places. She ranked Rome as her first 
And then the second was uh, actually Switzerland. So, um, so we went to Rome in after the interview in 2013, I booked a trip, um, Avita and I, my wife and I, and we went to Rome, actually, for the first time we did uh, Venice and Florence and Rome. So it was really exciting to, to see that. But I can't compare it to much. I just went to Greece. That was really cool. But like, I can't, I don't have like all of those places to yeah. compare, but we're, we're creating our list too, which is, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, we just went to Switzerland for Christmas. The last time the family four will get together, probably because our son goes to South Korea in the army. Um, daughter's playing Division One hockey out east. So, you know, oh, we got nice. one last trip in, in Switzerland, and we had never done a ski trip in Switzerland. And that's another must do at that point when you're going to the top of those kind of mountains. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah, so uh, travel is is always exciting. We know we also travel quite a bit for Fortis. We're traveling mm-hmm. across the country quite a bit, uh, doing a lot of work, um, meeting with with partners, understanding what's happening in the ecosystem, industry events, all those great things. And what we've seen is kind of this world of payments evolve. And obviously, you've been been in the payments ecosystem for quite some time. Um, and there are these inflection points that happen in, in every industry, as, as we know. And, you know, there's been a question of, you know, how long does an inflection point kind of last, so on and so forth. I go back to the days at my family's uh, supermarkets where we accepted no payments in our fam- in my family hotels. We actually were in a situation where we would take those, you know, little slips with the, the, the knuckle buster and, and key them into a little box. Uh, trans something or another. I, f- I forgot what they, what they called those little terminals that they had. Uh, and, and it was, it was an interesting time. So you didn't know if it was actually approved or not until after direct billing was a bigger thing at that, that stage of, of payments. So as we look at the evolution of payments of where we were and where we are and where we're going, uh, do you believe we're at this like inflection point? Do you think we've already hidden inflection point is it coming are we in the midst of a of of an inflection point of the in the industry well we've kind of just gone past the physical of digital we're seeing more digital than physical now when you go to an amusement park and it says you know no cash at that point it's going to be card only or something else at that point and then embedded payments has been right there with it it was the natural progression from there so i think we're getting away from the physical excuse me getting into the digital um, well into embedded payments at that point. And now it's got to be integrated in everything we do because now consumers are getting spoiled, right? They're like, what do you mean? I can't just buy that right now and use my biometric or do something else. So the more frictionless, the better. So, you know, to your point, we've already gone past the physical nature. Now it's a matter of optimizing the digital and the embedded piece. It's really funny you say that. I was at Ford Field on Saturday for an event, and um, it, it, the outside ticket booth actually people were going in to buy their tickets for this event. It wasn't a game; it was a you know educational event. And uh, so I'm watching these these people go up to the booth. And I see them confused. I'm like, "What's kind of happening here?" And I always kind of old school carry a little bit of cash with me no matter what. So I walk up to the booth and I'm seeing these people gather and they're all talking and they were not accepting credit cards or debit cards at the ticket booth for the tickets to get in to this event. It was cash only. And you should have seen the shock and awe of this thing. It was like, wait, what did you say? Like, no cash only? Like what? Wait, where are we type thing? And, and people don't really know what to do. I was actually kind of like shocked myself. I was like, wait, what's, how are you all getting away with this? Turned out there was a place inside you could go to and actually make your payment. But people are, uh, especially this this new generation, you see this idea that they are not, you know, in a position to to handle cash, or nor do they have cash readily available in a lot of cases. So it is interesting no, to exactly. see this shift. Well, I even get caught if you go into a cash only restaurant. It's rare, but you go in and like just want to let you know it's cash only. Yeah. Sometimes it's a high end steakhouse. Like Peter Luger's in New York used to be cash only for the longest yeah. time in a closed loop card system. You either had the Peter Luger's card or cash. That's it. It's the only way to take it. Exactly. Exactly. And I actually, that did happen to us at Peter Luger's (laughs) and we were, (laughs) we were told ahead of time and here we are payment guys going into the Peter Luger's. (laughs) Like, Who do we talk to? But no, there was no talking. (laughs) I don't know if that's changed since or if, 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 or how that, that turned, but that's really, that's, that's really interesting to see. So I think that inflection point is really interesting because the habits of like, when I look at like the, you know, 
generation that was making those payments at the window that didn't have it, they help dictate where an industry is going to go, right? Because it's more common that if we don't have cash, if you want to be relevant in the future, you have to accept what your customers are offering. And the customers are really driving that. I mean, the Amazon experience, like if I'm making a purchase between two products and one allows me to hit a keystroke and, and order it and the other asks me for my credit card information without being able to double click my my you know, iPhone and automatically make the payment go through right from my wallet, my likelihood of making the purchase d decreases. I'll actually go back to a place that already has it ready. I'm not going to go set up a whole account locally on a website and put my credit card in if I want to write on, on the on the spot, make the purchase. Now, to um, our, our grandfathers and great grandfathers and mothers, they would be like, you are very lazy. <laughs> It shouldn't take you that long to make a couple extra keystrokes. But I think we have this understanding of reducing keystrokes matters, that we are in an environment but because it's available that we are wanting to exercise the use of these types of technologies. So as, as these things are evolving, how do you see kind of the emergence of embedded payments specifically? And how would you kind of differentiate embedded payments versus integrated payments because I mean, you know, eight years ago, 10 years ago, it was all this integrated payments, integrated payments, and their shift happened somewhere along the line towards embedded payments and, and how that kind of began. Yeah. And it's, it's the right question to ask, right? Cause it, there's sometimes there's confusion in the wording and others, but when you're looking at just to start with embedded payments and kind of work from there of every dig digital touch point is now becoming a transaction touch point, right? So now everything you do, digitally, you're seeing something, there's probably going to be some type of action that you want to take or what I call and try to teach merchants is don't lose the moment of inspiration. You just talked about it. I might lose the moment of inspiration if you ask me to retype my card because all of a sudden my phone or my laptop doesn't recognize the protocols that you used and doesn't bring my eight cards up without using a wallet. You know, it's just there right now. Like which one of these eight do you want to use that you used to buy it? Uber and Lyft and Amazon and something else, it keeps it all in memory. If I don't have that experience, I'm going to lose that customer now. Because now to your point, I, I, yes, I can type it, but I don't want to go fumble for the card or even scan it or do something else. It's like, I've already done that homework with somebody else. Let me do that everywhere. You know, kind of at that point. Um, and, and people are expecting that to be wrapped into one experience, right? Um, yeah, and when you're looking at kind of the, the play between embedded and integrated, right? They, they work, they work together, right? But, um, you know, integrated payments refers to like systems of where the payment functionalities are added to the software, right? So integrated payments from where the software via the APIs and the others where embedded is kind of deeply ingrained into a software, into an experience, right? So integrated is kind of using the tech and the others. And are you integrated into a third party or my, whereas embedded is, it's one experience. It's just one thing. I mean, they're close, but they're still separated. You can be integrated, not have a great experience. I could be integrated to PayPal. And all of a sudden I have to flash over to the PayPal experience and put in all my credentials and do everything else. If I'm embedded, and it, it asked me for PayPal, but it already knows me and says, click here to approve it already done at that point. So those are kind of the nuances where integrated is closer to the tech and bet it is really about the experience. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And I, I think like a lot of it is this idea as well of the technology allowing it to further, you know, embed versus right. just be a simple one API to something, right? Like that, and that's where I think it was at, at the time. It was just like, "Hey, just give me one line to make a payment, and that's all I need." For, as a software, just make the payment, and that's all I need to do. And now it's become, it's evolved to something much larger and more complex. I mean, even from a the perspective of speaking about payments in general, right? You know, when I started in this business, there were a handful of terminals. You go, you know, door to door, make phone calls. Hey, I'm going to swap your terminal out. And it was a pretty simple experience as it related to, you know, save your money on your payments and drop a terminal in, take your old one out and let's move on. Maybe you got to deal with the, 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 the previous contract or something along those lines. 
And now you see this evolved experience that is heavily technological, requires almost like a software sales-esque model. And the same thing for supporting it, which has transitioned the industry from a place I don't know that I ever would have expected it to be uh, as it stands today. I mean, yeah. it is really cool to see the evolution over the last several decades. And, and thinking of that, the kind of part of it, where is, where are we going, right? What is it evolving to is an interesting thing to start to think about when we start to see what's happening. You know, Kevin and I spoke on the last uh, podcast about AI, Right. And we had some some you know quantum computing conversations around that and how that's going to affect the payment ecosystem, a world in which, like you know, we've already went from like the phone to now you can make a payment with your watch, right? And the kind of omni-channel experiences as we see them to, to continue to evolve and grow, and it's one of these things of okay, where is this next evolution going in this inflection point that we're in? Well, you start looking at, um, you know, blockchain and crypto and others. So yeah, there's AI in there too, but there's new technology available too. And what they now call it there, these DeFi platforms or decentralized finance platforms, right? So you get everything centralized in payments, or right? it has been for the longest time. You get into these decentralized instant reconciliation, instant contracting environments that are spot on, um, you know, everything ties out at the end and it's instantaneous. That scares a lot of people because that takes some layers out too, but it takes a lot of trust that has to come in. So when you're looking at what's that next wave of everything and when you tie AI into a DeFi platform, um, it, it's, it, you know, those that don't play are going to be left behind and it's going to be exponentially left behind. Not like in the, in the past or like, oh, I just needed to pick up an extra APM or even now, all right, can I accept Apple Pay or Google Pay? Like, that's not that hard. But to put in a decentralized finance platform and tie it to payments and then make that kind of your buyers and sellers coming together in that environment, that's going to be the game plan, right? Because programmers up till now, and nothing against Kevin and the engineers and everything, right? But, um, you know, Kevin knew. It's, it's a lot of people treat it as an afterthought. They're like, oh, payments is the easy part. Let me go build this. Let me go do everything else. And I'll just slap payments in. We make payments look easy, the, us professionals and everything that are in this game. But when people get into it, they're like, oh, there's the regulators. There's the rules from every acquirer. The, the coding's different. And there's things that you don't know. It's not in a book. I go, yeah, this is why you work with experienced people that have been around the game for quite a while. Um, I've got a ton of scars on my back of what doesn't work in payments because you just don't know till you get in, but you want to work with people like that because you, we know how to get out of it. We know how to circumvent it. We know how to avoid it in the beginning. So if you go in thinking payments is easy, you're going to make a lot of mistakes and you might not be able to recover in time when your competition used other venues and people to make that happen for them. So I think it's more the 100%. decentralized finance platforms, blockchain, and a little bit of AI yeah. is really going to be the game changer. It's a, it's a really important point, I think, that you bring up as well. Like, you think about when the payment conversation is brought into a developer and, and, and software engineers conversation. I've seen it. I'm sure you've seen the same where they do build their technology out thinking that, you know, payments is all the way down here. It's, it's, you know, out of a hundred point step system, it's 0.75 right. and they've done everything. And they thought about their marketing plan. They put their business plan together. They built the software to find out that it's not going to work the way you think it's going to work. I think there are a lot more industries, the way that we behave as consumers, we don't fully recognize how much of our behavior is actually, actually a result of the payment brand rules and the payment technology uh, uh, strength of, of dictating where things need to go. And a lot of that has to do with fraud and protection and chargeback protection that we've seen in industry. As an example, <clears throat> back in the day when I'd go to a gym, it was very common to pay for your three-year membership ahead of time. Or, I don't know, the Victani model where you had a lifetime uh, membership fitness oh, yeah. USA. You could pay like that lifetime. I'm going way back, by the way. Now, Bally's, <laughs> so, Bally's was famous for the ten dollars for life. Yep, there you go. Was, yeah. For life, and they would have this thing, and they would hunt you down if you stopped yeah. paying. And one of the things that the 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 
Yeah, that's exactly right. And I remember I got, I got, you know, why do they keep calling? My, my, my dad gave me a hard time about that one. So, um, you know, what you started to see was, well, why did everything go to this $99 upfront or upfront fee and then monthly? And one of the reasons the payment industry under the card brand rules stopped allowing it. They basically said, look, we have to have this chargeback protection period of 180 days, roughly. And based on that, to protect our consumers and to protect our members of our, our, our cards, um, you have to follow these rules or don't accept our cards. And that is how we started to see all the shifts of, hey, look, you can't promise somebody something three years in the future. You don't know if you'll be around for three years. So what guarantee can you provide? So those shifts have been quite inter interesting. And I don't think the general business owner, the general software uh, uh, provider fully understands how the rules of the payment industry trump their local rules even when it comes to, as an example, if I want to say, hey, I'm going to charge you a week in advance uh, cancellation fee if you decide to cancel at my hotel. Well, the card brands have other rules. So as long as you use the card, they're going to give that money back to the card holder. You could go sue them for it. But like from a convenience perspective, it becomes very inconvenient when you're not following the card brand rules. So it's best to align with them. And it's best to introduce, in my opinion, payments and payment conversations sooner rather than later when you are talking about not just what I'm launching today as a new technology, but I'm in, I'm in technology today. What is coming? What do I have to be uh, uh, concerned with? And, and so on and so forth. And I know we preach this quite a bit, but it's an interesting thought that people don't really look towards uh, uh, soon enough. Oh yeah, you work backwards from the customer experience, or you should. And part of that experience is, how are they going to leave you? It's kind of like when the when the plane shows up at the gate, but there's nobody there to get you off the plane. That last bit of experience, you're like, this airline sucks. If they can't even just have somebody here to open the the door, I don't care that you got here early. You just made me wait 15 minutes, and now I'm late or something. That was your memory of that the payment experience at the end of the checkout experience of how this ends of whatever you're product is or service right now you get people at the tail end of that and they're not happy they will give you a bad review of everything else the meal could have been excellent or anything else and it took the waiter 20 minutes to check me out because the point of sale didn't work or i couldn't check out on my phone or they didn't recognize the, the payment mechanism that i used and they didn't accept yeah. this or something else so yeah that's why you work backwards from the experience of how do i want the experience to end and it probably ends in some type yep. of transaction. And then let's worry about everything else beforehand. Have you seen actually your experience at these like um, airport restaurants now where like they literally put a QR code on the table, you scan the QR code, you put in your order and they just like kind of anything you want. You just kind of, oh, another, you know, another soda. Check out. Somebody brings you your soda. Have you, have you felt this quick really amazing i think it's a genius experience by the way as long as it's done right right you, you can yeah. pick oh, yeah. and do it because you, you look at you know quick service gas stations you walk up to the kiosk you just put whatever you want or you can do it on your phone walk in the food's all ready for you at that point similar concept where i can order ahead and brings it to you at the airport because it's, it's it's almost like these um what do you call them food halls when you can go or it's like a bar yeah. and five different restaurants that all look like little stands, but you can sit at your table and order. They'll bring it right to you from I order yeah. cousin's lobster yeah. to the French fry guy to something else. You make up your own meal out of four or five different little stands to do it. But it comes back to that experience again of, to your point, did it work? Did it flow through? Is it seamless? But somebody had to think that through at that point, you know, Absolutely. some of the latest ones now that have taken forever is tipping in a hotel room. You know, how often do you still scramble for change to be able to, you know, dollar bills or everything else you want to leave in the room for the housekeeper? Um, but you can't do it. You know, finally, the QR codes are coming or the driver that takes you from the rental car place back to your gate and helped you with your luggage or something. Simple little things that you used to tip for. And if you're not carrying cash, yeah. Which is quite common. You can't do it. Quite common. Yeah. And would you say that that's probably one of the largest mistakes a software developer engineer might make uh, is not bringing that in sooner, talking to the payment folks about the the evolution. Because I know there's there are a lot of like 
companies out there that are self-served like so like but it's up to somebody that's not a that's not versed well in all of this 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 talk the talk track and the logic and so on so they go and they have to figure it out themselves on these sites like hey i want to do this this is the code and i do it but i feel like that's more of the back to your earlier comment that's the integrated track that's right. not the embedded track that's the i'm going to integrate this line and it's one lane and check the box has been checked when really i got to think about the ecosystem essentially of my software is that a big error or one of the largest errors that you see it's an error from the cio not recognizing it but more importantly the cfo right this is critical to your financial well-being of your company as well and you know that's why one of the pieces i just did before this you know in accounting today um, and i went back to my old big eight people a couple of them read it at that point they saw a little post and went back and i go look at you dusting off your accounting days as being a cpa of everything else um and that's why it works well for me because I work with you know the heads of the business side and the tech side to say, look, CFO, you should have recognized this as well. And you need to work in tandem with your CIO or your CTO to come up with that plan at the back end of that, right? Because to your point, the developer is looking at the coolest integrated tools, the APIs. Here's what you know company X is doing. I like their tech stack. I like this. But if the business hasn't bought in, they're going to look at you and go, we haven't even talked payments. What are you talking about? Yes, we're just going to accept money. Go make it happen, right? So there's got to be an education. You have to come with somebody like us or anybody else that we're advisory at the same time. We use the term payment guides or trusted advisor. Insert different word. That's what we're here for. We're not just a tech stack and integrated payments and great APIs and a stack. We've got a lot of experience across the team. Yourself, everyone, we, we purposely have done that. But the CFOs and the CIOs and others need to look for that guidance and not necessarily from a third party consulting firm either. It's like, look, go trust the people that, that know this stuff and, and get it done. So it was a long way to answer to, I think it's also the, the kind of the, the responsibility of the business side and the CFO specifically yeah. to really get more ingrained in what payments means and the movement of money and not just the money in. We've talked a lot about the money in. There's the move, money moving out too. What are they doing from a B2B sure. perspective? How are they paying their bills? How are they paying their employees? What's that movement of money? And it all relates to how we take money in and then how we allocate it back up. I've never thought of it really in those terms. Although we've talked about, you know, the CPAs and the, C the CFOs and the, the, the financial people really getting involved in that conversation is an interesting perspective. Well, it's a, it's a revenue sure. item. I mean, if it's going to be a revenue stream, yeah. right? If you're going to optimize, because it shouldn't be thought of as a cost. It's actually, I'm, I'm waiting. If I'm moving money, any trader will tell you every movement of money makes money in some form. You know, go back in the old days. So th there's never a starving trader because in down economy or good economy, they make money on every trade and could care less which way it goes. It's the same with moving money internally to your company. Whether you're taking in money or you're moving out money, do it optimally at that point and partner with the right people. Right. You can actually use it as another revenue stream instead of just thinking it's my investments. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So as we dig in to kind of these models of in, embedded, you know, payment facilitation has been a hot topic, you know, searched quite a bit, a lot of misconceptions over the term. I've had different conversations with different folks about pay fac, payment facilitation, the difference between, you know, pay fac and then lowercase payment facilitation, the facilitation of payments, right? I know they're like, we're kind of in, in two different worlds there. But at what stage of a business uh, software would payment facilitation make sense? Like how, what is your, your feeling about PayFAC and, and that product? I know, again, a lot of misconceptions on what it is and what it does. Um, and, you know, kind of that journey you know, of, of when it might make sense and pulling the levers around payfac. Right. So, and being a you know, former and current payfac veteran back before it was called payfac, it was called internet service provider. Before that, it was just called a PSP or payment service provider. I mean, there's so many different terms that were used in you know, like the early days of Etsy and PayPal back in the late nineties when this all started. And so really payfac, is an important piece because it's so difficult 
to get a merchant application through, especially in the early days, it would take you weeks. You'd go into a branch, you'd fill out the forms, you'd wait till they did the credit checks, and then they'd ask you 15 questions. And maybe in a week or two, you might be able to be allowed to conduct credit card transactions. And it's going to take a while to program into your system and do everything else. So then these payment facilitator companies came along, which was really nothing more than a technology to that a mini bank at that point, they had to have their underwriting controls. They had the same controls as a bank would and convince a bank that they could do the job just as good as a bank, but be able to board people much faster. So now they can control their own rules or influence the rules of the bank. And as long as they stayed with rules, it became much faster, slicker onboarding time. They could get more creative with uh, funding at that point. And these merchants, didn't even need to know the bank that was there. They could just go online, fill out a form. And now you can get instantaneous approval before it would take 24 to 48 hours. And all of a sudden you're, you're transacting and you're transacting at a rate probably better than what you would have got from the bank directly because the payment facilitator has economies to scale and gets a rate based on their entire book, not just on that one merchant. You know, so you know, the true definition of a payback is a technology that's representing uh, buyers and sellers in its own ecosystem, but those sellers operate as if they're their own. They, they use their logo of everything else. Not to be confused with marketplaces, which you're familiar with Uber, Lyft, Amazon, others. None of them actually sell anything on their own. They're bringing buyers and sellers together, but under a brand that you can hold accountable. So a marketplace means I deal with Amazon, I get my refunding from Amazon, if I have a problem, I complain to Amazon, I don't complain to the merchant that gave Amazon the goods. The same with Uber. I don't call the taxi driver if I left something in there. I actually have to use the app. Yeah. They contact the taxi driver. They we, we do. So that's kind of the difference between you know, a payback and a marketplace. But they're very important in the industry because it gives flexibility beyond what the banks provide. Um, you know, and so you just start to consider: Do I want to be? Do I, as that software owner, want to start getting into that game? Um, probably because then I can even make more economics and give them more toys to play with uh, reporting. And again, flexibility in terms of the settlement, it is enhanced reporting because now I dictate the reporting instead of the bank dictating simplistic reports, right. which aren't the greatest to, to get out of that. So these yeah. payfax or payfax lights or managed payfax, um, you should really look into that as a software player to get the maximum benefit out of it. Um, and you know, when you start getting up to, 50 million plus a year when you really want to start graduating out of some of the standard players that are out there that you can pay 2.9 and 30 cents or others and not make any money off of it. Uh, you start to control your own economics and realize this is where the CFO and the others come back into play going, wait a minute, we're leaving money on the table. It's one of the statements we make Timmy, you and I and others when we're, we're trying to make yep. bold statements in the industry going, you're leaving money on the table and here's how, or we'll even get, Right. more bold and say, if we can't save you 10 basis points, you know, here, we'll give it to you at that because we know that, that they're not making the money of everything else. I um, mean, right. more need yeah. to adopt that piece, but that's really, you know, getting back to your payfac and marketplace and manage payfac. It's still an important piece in the industry. It's been around for a while. There's a ton of false information that's out there um, on this yeah. stuff. And so we're all about, you know, just really demystifying the, the myths and the others, of, you know, kind of telling what's yeah. really, who are the players? Um, don't believe everything you read. Don't believe everything you hear. Be sure you ask for point blank dollars and cents. How is this going to make a difference to me? And how, is you, how are you going to help me, the software vendor, be more competitive amongst my competitive set? Yeah, I had made a video that kind of talked about the payfac like some of the little myths around it or where it might make sense and not and obviously i hit on some of the, the the very items you hit on and one of the things that i had made a statement on as well was this idea that you know it's not for everybody and one of the challenges i saw personally was this idea that when you're truly in an omni-channel experience with a sophisticated setup because we aren't in a world of just, let's say, e-com or like e-com kind of feels like or the card not present environment, if you will, kind of feels like it's it's really a great path. Like like 
pay back that it's, it's, you know, easy onboarding sign up right away because right. The birth of, of when you mentioned Etsy and some of these other things that kind of the peer to peer is a lot of where it started. They had like volume thresholds that were fairly low because they were trying to basically in a way, PayPal, uh, kind of has this, that experience. Hey, I can pay my babysitter. You could pay me. I could pay you or, or it's all kind of internal from that perspective as well. Set up your account really quick and start to, to accept payments. But as we, even today, I feel as though when you have like, Hey, look, I have, you know, 17 stations, like car, car present stations that exist in my ecosystem. And those are at 17 different locations across the country. And then I also have my, my internet account. And then I also have people on the road that are field serviced, right? I feel like the, the pay fact, the appeal of that pay fact model starts to decline. That's my personal feeling is how I've seen it operate in today's environment. Is that it? Would I, be, so it's a fair state and combined with with what it takes to run one. You need an underwriting department. You need you know, other people that are going to take the call on, on your behalf at that point, on behalf of other merchants. Now, there's a lot of operational and back office stuff that happens with our payback that people yeah. forget, which is why managed payback has been taking off. Going, wait a minute, I can rent. I can pretend I'm a payback and you people are going to do everything and you're going to do the PCI and you're going to do the underwriting and you're going to do the reporting and the customer service. And you're going to give me, you know, excellent economics on that. Of sometimes, you know, nine cents out of 10 uh, for everyone that comes through. Why would I, why would I not do that? That's the math that companies need to do if they want to be their own payback. It's like, look, here's what it takes to be a grown up payback. Do all the math. And if the economics make sense, great. But you're talking a couple hundred million dollars before that economics are going to oh, yeah. If you don't partner with the, if you partner with the right person, that should be the threshold at that point going, why would I ever want to do that? That's not my core. So do you want to be a professional right. payment payback operational hut? Or do you want to yeah. actually just do what your software does or just do what your core product does? And I think if I'm a software, there's not one answer. It is this idea that I do need my traditional experience for those more complex scenarios of the card present and all sorts of parts, but I may need this pay fact experience as a different part of my business. Is that a fair statement to say? Like, is it a, a, a one road or is there this opportunity to really work on as a software on both sides of the, well, it's a massive the, opportunity the to work on both sides, right? Cause you got to stay flexible and nimble. Um, because, you know, it's not all rainbows and lollipops too, even in a managed payback world. Right. So you have to make sure that you're working with somebody that has influence over the risk departments of the banks that they work with. You know, it's, are they known? Are they trusted? Right? So the, these risk people move around within acquirers too. And most acquirers are pretty risk averse these days, given some of the other banking issues that have been out there. So the chance that your MCC code that might be medium to higher risk. If you don't have tight controls over it, the acquirer is going to say no. But if you work with a managed payback play that knows how to speak to those risk people, that knows how to word it correctly to say, look, this is a safe business and here's why, and here are the controls and here are the other. So you need somebody to go to bat for you. So when you become your own payback, you're going to have to go hire that expert too. And you're going to have to have other people that know it. So it's more than just the tech and it's more than just even some of the operations. You still need people that influence Visa, MasterCard, um, the acquirers and others, because, you know, those people, they're, they're a little conservative right now. So you have to know how to speak the language. Yeah, possibly a yes and situation instead of a yes, you know or situations. Right. So yes, and I'm, I'm preparing for this. And how should I prepare for it? And you and I have talked at length about, you know, five, three, one, five year plan, three year plan, one year plan. And what are we going to start doing over the next 90 days to start executing against that plan? And I think that, you know, my advice has been to folks when when we would talk, you know, I'm a software company, I'm trying to figure out what I want to do, or I'm a merchant to try and understand where my business is going. And talking through those things, it really is an honest question to ask of what does that five year plan look like? Because this industry is moving very quickly. And there are a lot of things happening. And to your earlier point, you don't want to get left behind um, as this continues to evolve. The new kids on the block, so to speak, that are building new technologies and, and, and are 
sophisticated and they understand. So those that are planning for the next five, the next three, the next one, you know, are going to be the winners in my, from my personal point of view. I don't see how you're not thinking about five years from now. I know I heard um, Jeff Bezos say that, you know, I got a pat on the back for how we did last quarter. And I said, we planned that quarter years ago. This wasn't like a, a new thing. And I think, you know, when you're in year and you're starting to talk about, oh man, our software is not accepting payments correctly. That's a little too late uh, uh, to, to, to be thinking about that. So like yesterday, I think is when you should be having that conversation if you haven't already uh, with, 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 you know, the payment professionals. And, and one thing I'll say, you know, I know that this idea that, that, you know, this guided journey, right, that, you know, Fortis has as an example, is really something that is a need in the market, right? It's, it's this idea that Apple, as an example, is, is, a, is a great company to look at for that. It's like, hey, look, our technology is amazing. We have these amazing iPhones and iPads and our Macs are, are amazing products. And we talk about all the products that we're launching. But our products are combined with the experience at the store at the mall yeah. that when you walk in you also get this guided experience of hey look how did what's these little courses on how to make your apple experience better and so on and so forth again back to it's not one or the other it's not that you know this idea there was a big movement towards like brick and mortar is going to be gone right altogether was well, that actually true they they live together and they are able to grow together and i think that's something that our industry is at, at first worth fighting a little bit oh don't call anybody don't talk to anybody just go and and figure it out and it's going to be so easy to do well no there's the industry is so sophisticated it's so challenging to navigate these waters that i think one of the largest mistakes that a developer might make is not knowing their five year and then also not having those conversations, as we said earlier, soon enough. Yeah, not having the trusted guides at their side, at their disposal when they need them. You and I have talked about it before. If you don't want to sell just on support and the experience and everything, but you want it there if you know you need it and you want these people to be proactive on it at, at that point to where yeah. we're ahead of it. The, the Apple example is a great one. Exactly. Right? You walk in, there's the genius bar, there's somebody walking up to you, they could just, you could use it yep. or you couldn't. There's some self-service tools I can go do. I don't have to talk to anybody or I could just sit and talk to I somebody do. because I want to fast track it. I don't, to do it myself might've taken two hours. This person could do it in 15 minutes. So yeah, I'd rather do that. But you do have to have the right self-service tools combined with the experts that can help you. Um, I mean, Delta Airlines just went through a huge thing. Well, a lot of the airlines did after the pandemic, everybody left. Yeah. So they lost most of their phone operators or their experienced people or others. So they started hiring back and then they realized, wow, I need experienced people answering the phone because these people don't know the nuances of an archaic system and how to maneuver through it and how to do something else. They were losing customers because it was taking yep. hours to get things done supposed to talking to to an expert right so it's the same with these yeah. payment firms or managed payback companies there's a good number of them coming out there's not many experienced people in payback to go around so when you're a new up-and-comer managed payback regardless of you know folks that are listening to this and others when you're thinking about diving into this go to where they have the experienced people it's going to save you a lot of time at that point you can go exactly. test the waters everywhere else but you know if things don't go exactly as planned be very careful and it happens with the big people too you know i just came off an rfp sure. where they said we can't get customer service out of a top five acquiring bank I'm like yeah and they're like well how would you do it because you're much smaller than that here's how here's what you do it's because we have the people because we have the know-how and they go no that makes complete sense because we couldn't find somebody like your team at acquirer a for example and they're yeah. five times bigger than us ten times bigger than us Attention matters and sometimes they get too big, right? And that's something that is a delicate dance, as I like right. to say. And, you know, how do you grow and still give the attention? It is super important. Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Mark, sir, this has been a lot of fun today. And Thank look forward much. to seeing you here soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks Mark. Tim. Take care. We have three takeaways from this podcast. Number one, every digital touch point is a potential transaction touch point. And Mark mentioned that you don't want to lose the momentum of inspiration by missing an opportunity of an embedded handoff. Remember, 
that it is very possible to deliver a bad experience through a basic integration. Number two, don't make the mistake of putting off payments and putting it at the end of your development roadmap. Start with the end in mind and avoid making the mistakes of those who have paved the way in front of you. And number three, the economic advantages of Payfac is something that the CFO should be looking at. If you aren't a large enough company to start your own, we noticed that Mark mentioned 50 million a year, investigate the benefits of using a managed Payfac from experts who have your best interests at heart. Well, that's the episode of Embedded. If you have found value in this episode, please leave us a five-star rating and subscribe to stay up to date on payments, software, and emerging technologies.